Welcome to Make Things That Matter, the podcast where we explore impactful products and the cultures that create them. I'm your host, Andrew Scottsko, and if I'm doing my job well, each episode of this show will help you to do meaningful work, make things that make things better, and have a great experience doing it. This conversation is with Eric Stege, an energetic product leader with over a decade of experience leading large-scale, innovation-focused product teams. Eric actually started his career with what I think might be a perfect background for a product leader as a pro soccer player and then a Division I college soccer coach. He's got a master's in sports psychology, he's been a founder, and then went on to become a product product manager and product director. He currently works at Amazon AWS and is building the world's largest community of product management and innovation consultants. Basically, his teams help other companies adopt Amazon's secret sauce for building new products and businesses. This conversation starts riffing and opening up a new topic area that I'm really interested to explore more deeply on the show, which is about how to approach culture building. Specifically, we focus on how to treat your culture itself like a product. We riff a lot here, exploring different ideas about how to approach this, and it's a lot of fun, and I think it will leave you with some good places to start. With with all that, please enjoy this conversation with Eric Stege. Eric, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. I'm thrilled we're going to have this conversation. I think you have such an interesting perspective to come at this entire conversation from, not just on a cultural lens, but also you know your work in product. I didn't realize that you actually started your career doing college soccer coaching. That's and right. I, I was like, wow, that is unusual. Like, tell me about that. And, and like, how'd you get into that? And how does that shape you today? That's a great question. First off, excited to be here. And um, most exciting, we were talking about this right before we went live, uh, talking about culture and transformation and product might not sort of intuitively come together, but looking forward to talk through that. And a lot of these ideas are a little bit uh, newer um, and and not super polished and haven't presented, you know, to to hundreds of people in a in a in a conference before. So excited to dive in and just explore this new topic with you. So yeah, I played uh, college and some professional soccer, and then after uh, an injury and not getting my contract renewed, and an opportunity to join the coaching ranks, uh, coached some Division One college soccer in in the U.S. And oh, right on. What position do you play? Uh, I I started out. Uh, in, at Ford, but the the more the the more advanced, the further back the field I went. So I don't know what that meant. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I think it means you got smarter and you could see the whole game better instead that's of just right. like trying to put it in the goal at the end. That's right. I I, I think that's right. I uh, I read the game well and could organize, but maybe I wasn't quite as uh, as uh, athletic as some of the other attackers that uh, stayed up stayed up top. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with that. It works. It, it, right. it speaks well to you to your your mental capabilities. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so so you were doing the pro soccer thing and then. And you got hurt. You know, injuries are part of the game and it's sort of the classic. It's easy to do well when everything is running smoothly, when you get along with the coach, when you're at, at the top of your fitness and, and it's, it's hard, it's the hard part. And sort of, I think where, you know, this is true for anything like, you know, professionals stand out from sort of the more junior people is that you're able to still perform well when things aren't going, going smoothly, where not all of the cards are aligned. And so, um, yeah, Got injured and just by the sort of right time to, to move on. And I didn't really have a backup plan, but the opportunity presented itself with coaching. And I think it lends also to um, a little bit being the field general and organizing, mm -hmm. you know, from a defensive standpoint uh, that led me into coaching. So, so got into coaching and first first job was I actually coached high school soccer, but then got into um, coaching at West Virginia University and was there with the men's team there for a couple of years and then right moved on. on to a couple other jobs. You always hear this term player coach, yeah. but you actually are a, you actually were a player and right. a coach. Right. How did that change your perspective on, on things like moving from on the field to the sideline? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, uh, you know, what I think is interesting about soccer and I, again, this, this isn't funny because like we're, we're diving into sports here versus project culture, but I think the interesting, like lots of sports, you know, every sport's unique and you have your individual sports where it's just you out there. And like, if, if you know, like, tennis or golf. And so there's a different kind of pressure and, and sort of mindset to that. And then there's team sports. And I think what's interesting about uh, the team sports is there's obviously the people dynamic and you it's, it's, it's in your own head, but it's also like, how do you, how do you as a team sort of do something better than, you know, sort of a bunch of individuals. And, mm. and then I think even in soccer, it's interesting because this is true for like basketball and hockey, where once the ball's rolled out there, so it's a player's game. There's no timeouts or there's very few timeouts. There's, not as many set plays, you know, like, mm -hmm. like in some of the other sports where, you know, literally 
you know, a coach can can call every pitch in baseball essentially, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, call in call in the the pitch to the catcher, and the the catcher you know relays it to the pitcher. Or in football, where you have a bunch of plays, and even in football, you know, the some of the strategy is you can script the first twenty plays, and then after that, you'll sort of adjust. And so, I think there's you know the player coaches, you have to do all your work, you know, in soccer like in preparation and sort of treat and and sort of create problem solvers and create sort of uh, sort of like now I put it in context of product, but like decision making frameworks where where players can understand like here's how we're going to play uh, in this situation. Here's what I'm going to try to do, but it can't be completely robotic or scripted. And so you have to sort of build those capabilities in in the practice field and sort of do the simulation so people can then sort of feel confident and execute you know on their own essentially in the game. And then in the game you're you don't really have that big of role as much as you yell and like <laughs> cheer from the sideline. It's 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 a lot less involved than you know in some of the other sports, and that that was the biggest shift, not being directly uh, able to impact the outcome of the game. I didn't take sports to the levels you did, but right. I, I also grew up playing a lot of sports, and I've always been fascinated by coaching specifically, and it's such an interesting pivot point from sport to to the world that we spend our time in in right. terms of company and, and product building. I'm curious to get your take. You know, in the world of sports, we have these very defined, you know, the games are very well defined, mm-hmm. right? They're finite games, to use that language from yeah. Simon Sinek. And then he's referencing um, James Carsey, uh-huh. finite and infinite games from like 20 years prior. But anyways, the reason I bring this up is that soccer or any sport, it's a finite game, you know, known players, set rules. We know how right. this goes. And it's it's well constrained. Yeah. And so the way you develop players is much more understood. Yeah. But I found that the analogy, I, I'm trying to figure out what's the equivalent in the world of business or in product of, mm-hmm. okay, like what is our equivalent of running two minute drills from football, right? Or how are we simulating these complex, intense situations for people when they're kind of, quote, performing, like playing the game all the time and there is mm-hmm. less practice? Have you thought about that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always innovation, um, but just, just like in product, you know, there's no metrics now. Like, there's sort of a a little bit of a you know a SaaS B two B playbook, right? And um, mm-hmm. you know, there's some some of the you know, the, I'm sure there's sort of the equivalent of two minute drills for like customer acquisition and growth growth hacking and stuff like that. But you know, every you know every business model is a little bit different. Then once in a while, you sort of have you know something fundamentally you know, some new fundamental business model like an Airbnb or uh, an Uber, which, you know, sort of seems so obvious in hindsight, but it was actually pretty game changing. I think it's a really nice pivot point into the main topic we're going to talk about today, which is about culture and how do you treat your culture like a product itself. And one of the analogies that I think might help us make this, this leap here and make this bridge is there's a, you know, as I was listening to you talk about being a coach on the sidelines, right, and building yeah. frameworks, yeah. Um, that, that goes to a lot of the ways I think about leadership in terms of one of the core roles that someone has to do in coaching and leading is teaching others to think, basically, yep. um, and it. to execute as you would want them to execute, right. even if you're not around. I think that's a really interesting exploration. Like, There's two ideas that are bubbling up here that maybe I'm, I'm going to just tee them up to you and see where you want to yeah. take them. That's the first one. The yeah. second one is this idea that... Um, the job of a leader is to create an environment where people can sort of rise and play to their natural best, right? To develop mm-hmm. and express their, their unique talents in the best way possible. Um, yeah. And that by creating the right environment, those talents will be expressed and the whole team will rise together. So right. I'm just teeing that up for you as a jumping off point. What do you hear in that and, and where do you want to go with that? I think we should jump on both of those, but those are good. I think let's start on the second one. So, cause I think that's a good sort of framing. Like um, my frame of reference is I've been involved with a couple you know, big, big company. So think about like fortune 200 companies, you know, over 10,000 employees, you know, culture transformations. And Mm -hmm. in my current role today, I'm actually at AWS uh, in a, in a consulting role, you know, we're, we're providing professional services to customers that, that sort of ask help, help us build products like Amazon and help us build a culture of innovation like Amazon. Mm. And I think, I think they're, um, you know, I think the lens, I like the lens that you framed it as leaders. How do we create an environment where we make it easy for employees to do the right behaviors that we want them to do? Mm-hmm. To me, that's like a, what your culture is really culture. You know, there's some very sort of uh, academic, you know, cultural anthropologic definitions of culture that are, you know, tied to like all the, all the rituals and all the artifacts mm-hmm. and all the mm-hmm. you know, stories that, that, uh, that a tribe will tell. 
And I think that's an interesting lens to, to look at it through. But I think like at the end of the day, culture is about behaviors and our people, you know, what, what behaviors are, are, is a collective group of people exhibiting on a daily basis. And so um, I think under that lens, you know, culture transformation is really about how to create processes, systems, you know, to, to allow people to do sort of the quote unquote right thing, however you're mm. defining the right thing is. And to me, those, those should be observable behaviors. So that makes sense. Um, you know, so there, how do you get, and then how do you get intentional about those? Like behaviors can happen accidentally or they can be highly intentional. Or, you know, if you take it back to the sports analogy, like practice makes perfect, mm -hmm. um, you could be practicing perfectly wrong and like think you're doing mm -hmm. a good job. But if, if, if you don't know what good looks like or, or those aren't clear definitions of what's valued, what's expected, you know, you know, being an employee in a company, I think, you know, that's where, you know, cultures just happen versus uh, mm. leaders and, and a company are intentional about uh, the culture they're, they're crafting and building. Yeah. I think you're really onto something there, right? In the sense that culture, well, culture, it, culture will always happen, Right, but probably not the one you want. Yeah, and so I think the the more maybe better way to say it is, you know, what culture do you choose to cultivate that is going to be maybe a, uh, not just a competitive advantage for your company, but you know, the kind of place you want your company to be or your team to be. One of the things you had mentioned to me before we went live was this idea of that I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about about running experiments on your culture, yep. right? Because in the world of product development or just, I mean, the lean startup blew this up 10 years ago, but right. know, we're all used to the idea of experimental thinking by now, H2, H3 innovation, et cetera, et cetera. But I think applying that to culture is very interesting. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you think about that. Yeah. So um, it's always been curious to me, and I, I sort of think there's like a gap between, you know, every co every company has co values, you know, they, they put them up on a wall or put them on their mm -hmm. website. Um, and, you know, probably there's something around being customer centric and being agile and Don't being, integrity. Yeah. And so these are sort of, yeah, these are sort of like catchphrases, buzzwords, and they don't really, you know, even innovation doesn't really mean anything, but you know, what I would challenge and, you know, when I've been working on some of these transformation initiatives, I, I said, how do we get that to like that, the next level of detail and take it to an observable behavior level. And so, so first you got to define again, what, what are the behaviors we're trying to do more of and do less of? And so, and obviously if, if that will be mapped to like being innovative or customer centric, you know, let's, let's stay with customer centric. So what observable, what observable behaviors should we see? Uh, you know, when we go walk the floor, you know, go, go observe employees to, to let us know that we're being more customer centric. And so, if you do that thought exercise with leaders or managers, even employees, doesn't matter. And they come up with some things that probably you know, maybe come up with um, using more customer data mm -hmm. or, you know, thinking through the lens, you know, the perspective of a customer, which isn't great, but, or, you know, we're talking to customers more frequently, whatever more frequently is, you know, then you create a definition around that. Um, we're, you know, and if it's really tangible, you know, they might say something like if we were really customer centric, we're, do you know? On average, you know, it, one of our teams are, are interacting with customers weekly. We're taking those insights and we're then converting those to do X, Y, Z. And so, if you sort of look through it through that lens, through the observable behavior lens, um, you know, that should have our product spidey sense, uh, I think, sort of perk up because we're all, I think, you know, trained now, you know, as, as sort of modern product managers to think about product is really about behavior change. Like how are we in ethical ways getting people to help get unstuck, getting people to, you know, do something they weren't able to do before, you know, an unmet need. And and a lot of times that's, you know, doing some new behaviors or being able to do a behavior they weren't previously able to do, you know, as well as they would have liked. And so, yeah. so if you apply that to culture, you know, we run, ex we run experiments all the time on how do we, how do we reduce, um, you know, a new a new customer's onboarding time and, and cut it in half. Or how do we get, um, you know, pharmaceutical company that I worked with? How do we reduce like the 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 days to fill and get their first sort of medication and take it by half? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of behaviors to get there and a lot of design and product decisions to make. But same for culture. If you sort of get down to like we we should be seeing more of these behaviors to to live customer centricity on a daily basis. Sure. Um, Let's define those. Let's and let, let's create some ways to measure them, and then we can run experiments against them. So, 
Um, you know, I've been on product teams where we're, you know, we'll, we'll, we're sort of at a localized level set. Hey, we want to we want to think bigger. We want to be bolder. And so, you know, we'll we'll track like, you know, has somebody called out like weekly or, or like daily, like and we'll keep it like a tally in a scrum board. Um, like, did we did we think big enough? Like, did we pose the question? Do we think big enough as we were brainstorming the solution? And hmm. we'll track like how often in a week did we sort of ask ourselves, do we think big enough or you know, again, back to like how many customer interactions do we have this week um, and and sort of run experiments like what might we do next week differently to increase that? Um, or, or, you know, improve that metric. And so there's experiments, you know, at the team level. And then I think experiments at the, at, at a company level that we can be running and, and have a lot more sort of intentionality around, um, tracking behaviors, running experiments and, and determining, are we actually living, are we improving, you know, the behaviors that we have defined, uh, defined for our culture? No, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and it really reminds me of um, two former guests on the podcast, Josh Seiden, uh, who wrote yeah. Outputs Over Output, which is you know one of those awesome books that I hope everybody yeah. reads. And I think he even had a, a little bit in there, uh, similar to kind of what you're saying now, where he was saying, great, you know, this all comes down, as you just said, to what is the change in human behavior that creates value? Um, right. And that human who's changing might be in your company or it might be your customer or a right. supplier or you know, whatever the case yep. might be. What occurs to me as I was listening to you just there is there's sort of two things that are coming up as I'm, that I'm wondering about. Because I, I've, I, will, I will admit, I, when I have personally tried to work on any sort of culture change initiatives in the past, let's just say it's been difficult. Sure. <laughs> it hasn't gone that well. Yeah. Um, and so I, I find myself wondering, like, okay, why don't we do, you know, there's many companies out there where we know we should be more customer centric or yep. we should be being more, you know, experimental and having more prototypes earlier on in our development process or yep. whatever you want to take. But why, it's like, why don't people do the things that we figured out we ought to do? I'd love to brainstorm a little bit about that, like the buy in side of thing. If, how do you get people actually on board with this? And I'm curious if you have any any personal stories that you've lived through uh, about how that either worked or didn't. Yeah, so I think there's sort of two. There's like a bottom up and a top down sort of approach, you know, to to this. So I mean, again, I would challenge any team, you know, especially a product team, as you're doing your retros, you should also be retroing, like. Obviously, what went well, but like again, how how could we have behaved differently? You know, are there, mm. you know, if if you have an emotional connection to your company and you have clear values stated, can you ask yourself at our localized team level, how could we have been more agile this week? How could we have been more, uh, you know, more transparent? Right? And I think you know, again, it's it's easy just to sort of take those words and and say they're sort of meaningless without definition, but sort of own that. You know, ownership is another value. Like how sure. we had showed ownership this week. Like what are the behaviors that us as a team could have exhibited more of this week? So I think there's a lot at the localized level you can do, but obviously, you know, there's uh, dependencies and there's only so much you can do at the at, at a sort of a team level. But again, I, I would say don't forget, you know, there's a lot of power in how do you want to operate as a team and sort of organize mm-hmm. and then hold yourself accountable to your behaviors and what are you sort of be the change you want to see in the world type thing, which I yeah, think is needed. Sure. But you only can get that so far. So that's where you need a top down. And I think um, I think you need some clear direction from, you know, a CEO. And and I know before we were, you know, we were talking about going live, like, does this apply to big companies or startups? And I'd say both. Like, I think, hmm. you know, it's never too early to design your culture and it's never too late. I think it's just, there's a, uh, yeah, I think a little bit more effort that yeah. you, that you need when you <laughs> yeah, get ten thousand people. It's a little 10, more complicated, people. right? <laughs> um, so you need that 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 leadership, and I think you need really clear um, definition around what your values are, and and again, I'd say define those out. And without mm. that, you don't know what good looks like. And so, if we don't know what like the keep that the behaviors that are valued and and look, look good looks like for your company, then that's really hard. I think a second thing. Uh, you know, second top down thing is I do think you need to work closely with people that have a lot of levers around culture and that's HR. And so mm-hmm. in my previous role, I partnered really closely and then actually reported in actually into our, into our uh, chief people officer. Oh, okay. and um, you know, I think there's some, a lot of great things you can do to help, help non-traditional product functions think like product thinkers. And so, you know, you have a bunch of HR policies that are su- 
AR in place, I think, you know, to put some checks and balances and sort of some some legit, you know, business reasons, you know, around confidentiality and privacy and security and things like that, that, you know, that HR rules and policies are created for. But but there's also, you know, policies that are meant to create value for employees that, mm. that aren't protecting the business, but protecting and, and trying to create value for employees. So there, you know, if you can if you can run experiments and get get partner with some of your HR leaders, um, you know, we had some things. You know, we ran some some sort of Scrum product sort of type initiatives with HR around um, employees rotating um, across different projects. So there's sort of a business need, but also a, an employee desire to get you know for cross trained and to sort of develop their from a career and skill mm-hmm. development standpoint mm-hmm. get get placed on a broader set of projects. And so this team. From HR, essentially built a talent marketplace, but mm. used a lot of like early discovery and sort of prototyping, and built something just in a, in a, in an Excel spreadsheet that they manually you know manually updated, and then started with a handful of managers and sort of grew and scaled it to an actually sort of automated process to match people with different opportunities internally. But mm. but they sort of didn't jump to that solution or didn't sort of jump to that scale, you know, before like starting small with discovery work and prototyping. So that's an interesting example. Other- I'm reminded of the um, what's the what's the law where it says every every complex system that works evolved from a simple one that works. I'm trying right. to remember the name of this right now. Gall's law states okay. that all complex systems that work evolved from simpler systems that worked. So if you want to build something complex, build a simple thing first and then scale it up over time. Right. That's that's I don't know that one, but that's a good one. Um, so I think another thing is um, you know. It, it's, it goes back to like intentionality around who who you're hiring and 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 hiring and then promoting. So again, I think there's different experiments you can run around that. Um, you know, Amazon sort of has the famous interview loop. You know, where they the mechanism they've built for hiring at scale is this bar raiser program where they've mm. and again they, they they didn't st- I I wasn't around when they did this, but I I can only imagine they didn't start with that as as the you know as the as the starting idea, but they've sort of and just iterated. Really quick, for anyone for anyone who's not familiar with that, what is that? Yeah, so um, basically, there's a bar raiser who is on every interview loop at Amazon, and there's a bar raiser and training program, and it's it's known as as a prestigious thing, and you have to do X number of interviews, and then sort of shadow X number of interviews in this bar raiser shadow program, and they're they're essentially uh, on every interview to check for cultural fit, and so they've been they've been nominated as somebody who exhibits great culture fit and they've been coached and, and mentored to essentially look and assess for culture fit on on interviews for for really any job it doesn't matter again the the job role but more uh, across any job role how you know is this candidate a good fit or not and so it's a mechanism they've built to allow for culture fit and sort of hiring for culture at scale and obviously they've invested a decent amount of time in terms of this growing group of people, community of, of employees inside Amazon that spends a lot of time interviewing candidates, spends a lot of time shadowing in this this bar raiser training program. Again, there's a lot of training, you know, shadowing and sort of mentorship that goes into that role. Hmm. So yeah. let me ask you this, this idea, I, I, I love this idea of treating your culture like a product because it's something I've been thinking about as well for quite a while. And yeah. the reason I think I started thinking about it was I was in the middle of trying to affect some culture change within a, a, a group level, not a team, but not a whole company. It was like a group level type situation. Yeah. And I was running into just loads of passive resistance. You know, it wasn't like there was, there wasn't much overt like out and out resistance where people were just like, this is dumb. It was more yeah. of the, the passive thing, which I think is actually where a lot of transformations end up dying. Cause a lot of things mm-hmm. get agreed to on paper and then, they just somewhere the resistance becomes too much and and you can't overcome inertia. Um, And the reason I thought of this was was like, well, it seems like places that do this well have a pre-existing understanding that this is something we will always be doing, that we will always be Mm. working on our culture Um, as opposed to many places where I think it just hasn't been a conversation. And so introducing some aspect of change creates fear frankly because yeah. you're like oh god you're changing my world but i didn't know you were going to do that so now i'm on like what are you doing right. um whereas if you came in like if from day one you were at this place you knew we, we're just always going to be working on how we work together like it's just part of yeah. what we do here um right. what do you think about that 
I think that's true to a certain extent. I think if you're an existing company and then all of a sudden leaders or manager, you know, managers start talking about we need to we need a culture transformation, we need to change, you know, how how we work, how we behave. It sort of feels and I've been in some of those situations, it sort of feels like you're you're sort of who moved my cheese, right? Sort of the rules of the game are being changed. <laughs> exactly. Like yeah. on the fly, it's like, why? But I think that's where you need, you know, there needs to be like a business imperative. You know, it needs to be sort of the burning platform, you know, the proverbial burning platform for mm. somebody to care. Yeah. And I think the, uh, there's a great podcast. Uh, I think it's on um, uh, This American Life, I believe, where it's about NUMI, which is the North America... We'll, we'll have to track this down. But yeah, it's, we'll, we'll find it's, it. We'll put it in the show notes. It's it's a car plant in California that was, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. It was Ford or Chevy, doesn't matter. It's an American company, and they were the worst performing car plant in terms of like employee injuries, in terms of car defects in, mm-hmm. in the country, and essentially through a forced change because the plant was was closed. And then Toyota said, we wanted to open up. They had all the infrastructure in place on so Toyota basis. said, like, we wanted to create an Amer- a Toyota American car manufacturing plant on this site. And then they rehired back the, the union auto workers to, to staff the plant. The transformation was successful. So, hmm. so there, like the point of the story is, you know. Same people, was, better cars. Same people, <laughs> they needed a job, you know, basically – if you want a job, here's like the new rules of the game is, you know, and basically then adopting the lean Toyota manufacturing process. And it became the number one performing plant in, in the, in the U S wow. and, and, but they weren't able to, Toyota wasn't able to replicate that at, at as well as at other plants. Um, hmm. Because I would argue there wasn't sort of that burning platform of, Hey, your plant just got shut down. If, you know, if, if here, if here's the, if, if you want a job and he, sort of, here's like the new rules that you got to play by. And that's, that's a little bit, sad to think about like a little bit like does it really need to get to that stage to um to to be successful i don't think it does but that's sort of a pretty extreme example of um you know where where it wasn't working to then where it was became high performing you know it's funny i've talked loosely around this topic with with a whole bunch of folks on the show and that is what you just brought up is the burning platform has been far and away the most common answer from folks i've talked to who have you know, successfully done turnarounds basically yep. on a culture, almost to a to to a person. They've all said, "When well, I'm like, well, what has to be present for this to work?" And the it basically comes down to pain. They're like, yep. they ha- there just has to be pain." And right. I, which I okay, fine. But I'm actually, I think I'm a little more interested in, and a lot of people I speak to, I think are more yeah. interested in the second version of like, okay, well, what if it didn't have to be that way? Like, what if we right. could create this amazing thing without the world, you know, or the whole company about to implode? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's where that is a great question. And I think, but there has to be the motive, the motivation has to come from somewhere. So, uh, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I I do think there's gotta be sort of a a watershed moment of like, why, why do I need to to change fundamentally how I'm working? Cause again, I think of these transformations, it's, it's, it's a pretty big, you know, pretty stark difference of how we're working today versus Mm -hmm. how we need, we, we need to work in the future. And that's, that's pretty tough. I am a big believer in like continuous improvement, and so I think, again, if you can put the right mechanisms in place and and, and you know set set the the vision of where you're trying to get to, and allow teams to sort of self organize and and try to sort of move in that direction, you, you'll get pockets of change, and you'll get some teams that jump on that. But again, from a full scale across an entire company, I think it's hard to get everybody. Uh, you know, fundamentally working differently in a somewhat meaningful timeline. <laughs> As we're riffing on this, yeah. what's occurring to me is that it, you know, A, it probably depends on the scale of the change we're talking about, right? If we're talking about a wholesale, like cultural change, yeah, it's going to take yeah. some kind of, it's probably going to take some big, some big watershed moment the same way, yeah. you know, yeah. that's usually how it goes in, in people's personal lives as well. If there's a big right. change, usually something triggers it. I think what might also be more in line with the kinds of cultures that we're hinting at here is, and this is where I go to the agreements, like sort of an agreement that like we are going to always be pushing the way we do things. And as a result of that, we're going to be continually changing the way, you know, we're going to continue to innovate in our processes. Um, yeah. That's kind of what, I, I, what I'm hearing. Yeah. Two, two thoughts there. I think, A, I think that's a culture you need to define and create. And I think 
partially that starts with who you hire. I think there's a lot of, you know, again, are you hiring builders? Are you hiring people that are sort of continuously thinking about it, wanting to improve what they're doing? I think a lot of people are wired that way, but some people aren't. Um, so I think there's intentionality on on that and incentivizing, you know, if you change this and it it's better, like, you know, there's there's some some upside or some, some you get something out of that, right? Versus just like a pat on the back. Um, mm. Also, though, as you know, maybe jump on back for a second. Um, I also think of this sort of change management through, you know, there's certain traditional sort of change management theory models like Adcar's one. So Adcar's like a, a, a group of people is aware, you know, it's a, an awareness state, and then they move mm-hmm. to desire, mm-hmm. and then they move to a knowledge how to change. Mm-hmm. And then they move to ability to implement the change. So not just I know how to do it, but like I have I have skills to change and then reinforcement. So then you're sort of like in a, a sustain mode. And mm-hmm. um, I think that's an interesting lens to, to look through in one sense. And again, that if you think of that and you sort of map that to uh, like a p- pirate metric sort of or like, okay. you know, you know, think of it as like you're aware of a product and then you, you have this desire like, I'm aware of this. Like I'm, I'm kind of intrigued, desire to use it. And then they like, they acknowledge, they know how to use it. So maybe, you know, you have a, it's a freemium model or you have a, uh, you know, a pilot program or, you know, beta test or whatever. And then they actually use it and get value. So they have the ability to use it and, and easily. And then they're like, then you have them hooked. So I think you can sort of look, look at culture transformation sort of through that lens to a certain extent. Um, think of it like you would, you know, through a, a conversion pipeline. And then, and then people move through that at different speeds. And some people can move from like aware to like, I'm ready to buy like right away. Like that's your early adopters or some people need to see a little bit more proof in the pudding. Right. So those are your laggards. So I think you can think of it that way too. So not everybody changes at the same speed. And so in a big company, you know, maybe, you know, I've, I've used this, you know, in some of my transformation efforts is mapping people to like a, a product life cycle curve. So like mm-hmm. who are who, who are early adopters? How can we observe them? What what are they doing today that we know that they're early adopters? Let's start there. Let's build some momentum with that group. Mm. Probably they're already trying to change. Probably they adopted um you know some of the new new frameworks. They've started doing lean startup. They started to sort of self 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 do, you know, design thinking, whatever. Sure. Um same then with uh you know who are the who is the the late you know, the, the late majority. So like, you know, they just, they maybe need to see a little bit, but they, they, they're not quite as ready to jump uh, all in like an early adopter would, but then, yeah. you have the, then you have the laggards, right. And then the laggards, you know, you need, uh, you need to probably do, do more support, sort of treat them as a different type of segment than the first two. It's like, what are the tactics you need to try to bring them and, and sort of help model the way for them or get them comfortable. And they might never get comfortable. That's where you have to, um, make some hard decisions, just like, you know, you have to sometimes fire customers, you know, that don't necessarily fit your profile anymore, or they're like too, too costly to service. Like, again, I don't think that, you know, I think that's a last resort, but, you know, again, if you're being intentional about the culture you're trying to build and you're giving people these pathways and, you know, being smart and, and empathetic to here's what we're trying, here's what we're doing today. Here's where we're trying to get to from a culture standpoint. And people aren't, sort of on board, then, then there's like just a fit question. And I think that's, you know, sort of an interesting sort of analogy across mm. like a product life cycle. I was thinking when you said the pirate metrics thing, I was thinking yeah. about, how, okay, how would we model this? I'm not deep on the world of change management. I know that's an right. entire discipline unto itself. It occurred to me that you, we might even be able to use something like, are you familiar with heart metrics? Yeah. 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 So for anybody who's not, heart metrics is happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Yeah. You know, usually sort of applied to like a given feature or a product to see how well it's doing as opposed to like pirate metrics, which is sort of, let me model my overall conversion funnel. Yeah, Very, very conversion. It doesn't have as much emotion, motion. Super super conversion. It's just about like, get the money in the door and off we go. Um, You know, useful, but different thing. But I was just like, Oh, maybe you could, you could even potentially apply um, some, some metric like that to your change management efforts to see, I, I don't know, as you were talking, I just imagined this little dashboard in my head of like the, the, you know, the whole early adopter, yeah. the whole life cycle, and then mapping out like the penetration in the market, but the market is your company um, and how you might do yeah. that. I mean, I think that's right. Um, you know, I've in, in, in some previous roles, again, I've, I try to sort of speak the language of, uh, 
sort of HR change management folks that I was partnering with, and they, you know they use some of the like like I said this ad car model, but I think it applies, and I like I like thinking about this through the heart framework where. Are they able, you know, in this new world, like task success, if again, if you're defining like what, what are a new set of tasks that somebody needs to do to be considered aligning with this new culture, this new way of working, mm-hmm. you know, how, how likely our users are can, you know, can quickly and easily complete those tasks. And so like, if they're not like, you can measure that. And if they're not like, how do you create more training support? How do you, you know, as managers, how do you reduce friction for people mm-hmm. to to have task success. Maybe they have the best intent in the world. Like, let's go back to the customer centric one. Like they, they don't need to be convinced. They, they see talking to customers early and more often is a better way to do it, but you have some legal policy that prevents that, or you can't find the right customer because you, you don't have the mechanisms and their tooling in place. So, so they're like, it's not, you need to convince somebody that it's the right thing to do. It's how do you reduce friction or, or improve the, the 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 ease to to do that that specific behavior, and th- so there, like I think that's like a good example. Then you could run experiments, like let's change our policy around, like let's run an experiment around changing our policy from having to ask permission to talk to customers to like you know guidelines to as long as you follow these these guidelines, you're good to go. Go talk to customers. Run that with one single team, you know, pilot with one single team before you roll it out to 10,000 employees. But like you could run that experiment, right? And see Mm -hmm. how it works. I've never heard anyone put it that way where it's like, oh, well, we can model these changes the same way we would model the changes we're trying to create in a product, frankly. I mean, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's people doing behaviors that hopefully create some valuable change. I'm resonating with your point about it is a way of sort of reducing friction or even identifying the points of friction because, you know, right. where there, wherever there's friction, stuff is not going to work. One of the things I'm wondering about is how early do you start working on a culture? One of the models that I have in my head is that basically your first 10 people sort of set your culture and then everything from there is going to derive from the culture that was formed with those first 10. I don't know if that's right, but it seems to have at least a grain of truth to it. What have you seen in terms of you know stuff you've worked on or folks you've engaged with in an advisory capacity? Yeah, so let's jump on that. I want to go back w- one second and then let's jump on like what's the right time. So I also thought this is just sort of a compelling how might we statement, but you know we have product dashboards and and I know these I, I know these exist, I, but I don't think they're super widely used. How could you create a culture dashboard? And again, mm. like what would be the in, like the inputs and data points? You know, what what should you be seeing as like leading indicators that your you know your company has has is a healthy culture? You know, is however you're defining that. So yeah, totally. Um, and again, you can track that. You can measure towards that. Um, you know, sort of uh, think of it as like a product manager of culture, right? And so, like, how would you run that? And I think we have all the answers in the toolkits. So we just haven't necessarily applied them with intentionality on the culture side. Yeah, that's but, interesting. Um, yeah, but going back to like, when's the right time? Now, I said this earlier, it's never too early and it's never too late, but I think it's easier on the front end. Um, and sure. so, yeah, in my lens, you know, again, I try to have a pretty simplified definition of, of culture. It's, you know, collective groups, observable behaviors. And so... You know, you have a culture when it's just two of you. It's just there's only two of you, and so the like definition you, I, that I like to use yeah. just to throw it out there yeah. is uh, simplistic as it is. It's it's just sort of how we do things around here. Yeah, that's great. I think that's right. So once you get a critical mass of people, how you're behaving, what you're doing on a day to day basis, you have a culture. You know whether it's defined or not. And so I think again the um, you know the 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 funny, you know, sort of interesting quote, I can't remember who said it, but it it was basically like every organization has a culture. Unfortunately, many, if not most cultures develop a happenstance. And so Mm. it's, are you, are you being proactive about it or not? And I think that that, you know, in today's, today's age of people want to be connected to sort of a a company that's sort of bigger than themselves and, you know, sort of Mm -hmm. have, have a culture that they agree, you know, agree and align to. Like, I think it's super critical. So how do you create, you know, how do you create a culture? You know, it should be part of your strategy. You know, what kind of culture do you want? Like what type of people, what type of employees, talent are you trying to attract? Um, not everybody's going to be a fit for every culture and that's fine, but trying to be explicit about here's, here's, here's the culture we're trying to create. Here's the the behaviors and the mindsets we, we value and, and we're trying to um, foster and hire for and, and then make sure, you know, there's transparency around that. And I think that that's important, especially, 
early on, you know, for companies when having the wrong culture fit, having the wrong, you know, hire is, you know, is, is a lot more impactful than maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, once you get to the the 500,000. Yeah. When there's seven of you, every person has a bigger leverage than when there's a thousand of you. I like that as a counterpoint because I've heard many founders or early stage company people say, you know what, don't even worry about it until you're at least like 25 people or maybe 50. Um, right. And I think there's, there's, you know, fair enough there. Like you probably don't want to get too heavy handed about it or even like you probably are not going to have an HR person below 25 right. people, maybe 50 people. Um, but I think what is, in my personal opinion, what should be non-negotiable, what I would love to see every founder out there doing is thinking about it, right? Like having mm-hmm. intentionality. I think that's kind of the underlying sort of yep. necessary ingredient here is like, well, you, you got to know what you want. You got to know what good looks like here. Yep. Um, and I think that is probably left by the wayside a lot in early stage because frankly, you're just trying to survive. You're just trying to, you know, get to default alive. Right. Uh, yeah. I think that's true. Um, you know, there's a lot of like, you got to, got to make your first sales. You got to prove market traction. So that, th- I think that's legit. I also think, you know, part of what, you know, what investors are investing in and sort of part of what, you know, the role of the first sort of founders and, and senior leaders are is like being a magnet for talent and the right type of talent. Right. And so Mm -hmm. again, going back to, you know, when the, when culture is not defined, you know, to me, like, again, I'm internalizing this a little bit. Like if I'm interviewing and and a culture is not defined and, and a senior leader, A, it doesn't, if I ask them like, Hey, what's your culture? Like, what, what do you, where do you want it to be? And where do you need to improve to get it there? And if, if that, if he or she doesn't have a clear answer around that, like that's a little bit of a red flag. Mm. Or if I get a, a wishy-washy answer or a, a different answer from, you know, I ask a CEO, what's, what's his or her, you know, ideal culture and what are they trying to build to? And you get a different answer from, you know, a, a team member, um, you know, again, that that's a little mm. bit of a red flag too. Yeah, checking for a misalignment. It's interesting. Yeah. And so, Again, I, you know, as product people, it would be weird for us to, for somebody to say, you know, how can you design and develop a product with more intentionality? You know, I think <laughs> now there's there's a lot of acceptance around what you know, what are the main levers you can pull? What are the sort of the main ways you know the main the main ways to operate to to build more intentionality around product development and product design? But but I don't know if again, it's you don't hear that as often as like how might we be more intentional about our culture, right? Mm-hmm. Designing our culture, and so um, you have a product roadmap. Why don't you have a, a a culture roadmap? Like, what are you trying to build and infuse? Yeah. And so those are just things that like it's easy to it's easy for me to yeah. sort of have these like b- bumper sticker slogans. But those are the things that I think about in my I, in my mind. Like, how would you build a culture dashboard? How do you build a culture roadmap? Just like you would a product. It's and no wonder we're talking about this because I've, right. you and I have clearly had similar parallel thinking on this. What you're talking about made me think of Ben Horowitz, right? The uh, hard thing about hard things where mm-hmm. he talks about, um, so there's technical debt, right? But there's mm-hmm. also cultural debt. And so mm-hmm. if if you, you know, and this goes back to like, when's the right time to, to be intentional about culture? Like if you let some things slide, like somebody's being unethical or somebody's you know, being disrespectful or not showing, you know, again, what, what you think is the culture you're trying to, to uh, foster. Like if you let some of those things slide, especially if you let it slide because somebody's a sort of a, a high performer, like that, that'll come back and bite you in the butt. And like, you know, I, I have business experience on that, but I also have like athletic experience on that. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you, if you sort of aren't willing to sort of hold your star player, you know, to the same, you know, or vice versa, or somebody who is, is a, uh, you know, not a starter like you have to hold everybody to sort of the same bar and if you let if you let the star player like get away with uh swearing on the field or you're doing things that like doesn't doesn't uh represent like your team well people are going to take that person's mm-hmm. lead and, and really listen you know model after them more than like you saying some words around that so that, yeah that makes sense if we take the stance that culture is at its best a competitive advantage that means it depends on who are you competing yeah. with and what are you trying to do and so on and so forth. Do you think there's any cultural universals? Well, let me think about that. I'll be sure. I'll, I'll be ruminating in the back of my mind, but I would reframe culture is a competitive advantage. I think it's like, again, it, it, as a founder, it might feel too early when, you, when you're pre product market fit. Right. But like, you know, once you get the product market fit, like people can copy, you know, there's not very many, there, there's some legit moats in the world. Like, the number of 
the 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 you know the two sided market and the number of hosts that Airbnb now has on their platform is like a true moat, right? Like it's mm-hmm. going to be hard to like it's replicate hard to beat that one. <laughs> yeah, like by by Airbnb stock, like the next time it dips a little bit because I'm pretty long on that. But yep. um, but like people can replicate products like relatively easily. Um, again, I think what what's enduring is like a culture of. And I'm not here to endorse Amazon, but a lot of the Amazon leadership principles about thinking big, about um, being customer obsessed, about uh, long term thinking. You know, I think these are enduring, you know, we call them leadership principles. But really, again, they're definitions around how to think and how to act that that obviously create the culture of Amazon, which is innovative and, and highly customer focused. And I think that that is a competitive advantage. And, mm. you know, I think um I think that is a competitive strategy in and of itself. How might we be the most customer centric company in the world? That's Amazon's mission, right? Um, and it's served served us pretty well. And you know, they try to figure out how to how to uh, how to build in mechanisms that that allow that to scale across you know every employee in different ways. Now we don't have it perfect, and there's obviously um, things to get better at. But I think that 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 is a competitive advantage in, in and of itself is to be you know, the most innovative company to be the fastest learning company mm. in the world, take insights to action faster than anybody in the world. Like those are enduring strategies. Yeah. And then the question is like, how do you, how do you create the mechanisms and reduce the friction for employees to actually do that? For sure. Yeah. No, and actually, yeah. as, as, as you're talking about that, yeah. not only is culture is a strong, and I think, I think I'm reminded of the book, I think it's good to great where mm. he talks about, like one of the differentiators of these companies and we're going to set aside all the stuff, all the issues of like selection bias in those companies, but whatever. (laughs) But one of the things that set that, set that apart was that it wasn't what the culture was. It's that there was a clear culture and that that culture was made very clear, very transparent. And it was, you know, well implemented. And I think that I think might be even more fundamental to generating the competitive advantage. And I just thinking about this right now, I think a reason this might be worth early stage founders and, and managers thinking about is recruiting. The talent war is so hard, right? Everybody yeah. is is trying to get great talent. And culture is not just a competitive advantage in your operations. It's in terms of recruiting, right? If you have a yeah. clear and compelling culture, that is going yeah. to give you a leg up compared to someone who does not. Uh, and so I think that might be a, a good reason to, for people to consider putting in the, the legwork. So last culture question, then we're going to go ahead and close out here. But who do you think is doing this well? Like if you were going to point listeners at some examples out in the world, is there anyone who comes to mind? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, I I have sort of an inside look at Amazon. I think we do a lot of good things around culture well. And again, I think the thing that's been amazing and, and help, a, a great experience for me to think at just the scale. So, you know, how do you build mechanisms that easily scale that that support the cultural elements we're trying to amplify. Um, and again, this, this, there's a lot of public examples, you know, you can go read about the leadership principles and you know, there's a lot of blogs around like the bar raiser program, but um, you know, I think, you know, the intentionality and again, the, how do you design systems at scale to support this? I think Amazon is good from a, at scale standpoint. Um, you know, I've been impressed with um, Atlassian, you know, they, I don't know. I, mm-hmm. I used some of their product suite, but I've I've heard. I'm blanking on his name now, but I've heard their founder talk about his points of view around culture, and you know he's talked a lot about design and how to, um, you know, how to design a culture that they want. And he, you know, he doesn't get down into like let's run experiments and sort of measure, you know, measure a, a culture dashboard. But I think just I've heard him speak and sort of had an intentionality around um, their culture there. Um, you know, look, outside looking in, it's not surprising, but you know, some of the, some of like the design companies, like you know, IDEO, you know, I think they've mm-hmm. done a good job, and again, have a pretty unique, defined culture, and have shown some um, intentionality around here. Here's the type of people we're trying to hire, and why, and then sort of showing that. But um, to be honest, I haven't looked. I, I mean, I haven't dug in too much, you know, except on some of my own personal searches to sort of understand and sort of, you know, vet like the product intentionality. So those are some that I've just seen externally that have impressed me. Yeah. A couple I'll throw in there yeah. and, and I'm going to think about this more and, and for yeah. the listener, we'll add all, I'd love I'll, to hear yours. This yeah. will all be in the show notes. A couple that come to mind for me 
um, on the smaller side of companies yeah. compared to Amazon, which is very, very large. Um, let's see. I can think of a couple, three, three right now um, that I'm going to give a shout out to. Um, I think 15.5, uh, which is a workplace engagement and management platform. They're most hmm. commonly known as an OKR tool, but they're, yeah. they're one of these, they're one of the sort of leading companies in the people tech, HR tech nice. space um, interviewed uh, their chief, their now chief product officer, Diane Frommelt. Uh, we'll link to that in the, in the show notes. Their, their culture is fantastic. Um, mad respect for them. So give a shout out there. They, and they, I think one of the things they do really well is not just that they have one, but they also describe it in a clear, compelling mm-hmm. way where you look at it and you're like, wow, that's amazing. Um, right. I think Asana does a great job of this um, yeah. from what I have gathered. I haven't looked as deeply into Asana, but uh, I've met a few folks who work there and, and the things I've seen when I've just looked at their you know company values and stuff seem right. quite good. And um, I, have to, I have to clarify, Asana, who's what I meant. Atlassian is the wrong A company and an ah, important difference in, okay. <laughs> <laughs> difference. In, in development tooling. So it was Asana. Asana. Got it. Don't, okay, yeah. Don't knock on Atlassian. I, I, they might do great stuff too. I don't know them. But yeah, Asana, I've also been impressed with them. Yeah, great. Yeah. And then the third one, I'm going to give another shout out to a previous podcast guest, uh, a lesser known company in the broad tech world, but a company called Glow, glow.com, G-L-O. Um, uh-huh. It's my favorite of all the yoga apps out there. They were kind of the first, and I still think the best one it it's the only one where you do it and it actually feels like being in a live class which has been amazing during a pandemic Mm -hmm. um and i had their ceo and founder Derek mills um on the show we'll link to that and he that is another great episode to check out for folks who are interested in this conversation because we spent a lot of time in that conversation talking through the nuts and bolts of how like what worked what didn't work the whole thing of the transformation of their culture to one that I think people would find deeply compelling today. Um, and it's a great from the founder himself story. So I'll give a, a shout out there as well. Was the glow example, like they sort of refound their culture, uh, you know, sort of there was some moment where they realized they, they didn't have the culture they wanted. And then yeah, they, 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 they were, re- they were, I can't remember the exact timeline here, but yeah. I mean, they were, they were uh, already been up and running for several nice. years. Um, they were at least four years in, I want to say maybe six, seven years in, Okay. And Derek was going through his own leadership journey and transformation and like just really thinking a lot about what kind of company do we want to build here? And that, and, and he'd already been thinking about it, but he just sort of had a, had a bunch of epiphanies and said, okay, there's a different way to go about doing yeah. this. And he, he, he said it, it uh, unfortunately got to a place where I think he described it as toxic. And mm-hmm. it was their journey from there all the way back to what I think now is, is an, an amazing culture. I, I remember walking in their office pre pandemic and like, right. you could feel it. Like you walk in and you're just like, Whoa, like what's, what's going on here. There's yeah. something, something's happening here. Um, so I, I want to give a big shout out to them. And they also just launched their podcast, by the way, which we will also link to in the show notes. The glow podcast is now available. So check that out, dear that's listener. That's awesome. That, I'm going to listen to that. Cause again, I think it's pretty unique where it's sort of, you're going down one path and then sort of reinventing, sort of refining your, your yeah. company culture, especially when, you know, when you're still relatively startup phase. So I will definitely check that out. Yeah. I mean, they were already up and running and doing like, they were doing well. I mean, they were yeah. pretty successful and they're bootstrapped too. Um, and so it was, I thought it was just a incredibly compelling, honest story from, you know, directly from the person who led that transformation. And he's so vulnerable and open about it. I thought it was just an amazing example of like, wow, this is, you know, I, I hold up that example to people now. I'm like, go listen to this. This guy, yeah. this is what you, this is how you do it. <laughs> That's um, awesome. It's, it's fantastic. So yeah, big shout out to them. So I want to shift gears here and uh, start to close out a couple of rapid fire sure. questions. Your answers can be as short or as long as feels good to you. Okay. So the first one is, you know, what is a small change you've made in recent memory, whether that's a week or a year, um, that's had an outsized impact for you? Wow. Okay. Um, uh, I actually gave up coffee. So at the time it uh. felt a little bit bigger than what it was, but, uh, <laughs> you know, pandi- a pre-pandemic, I was on the road a lot and, you know, would be get, get the, you know, Starbucks coffee or the coffee at the coffee shop and did a lot of that. Uh, and it just, you know, was feeling like I wasn't drinking lots of, you know, I wasn't drinking like eight cups a day or anything, but it just, I, I could start to feel that I'd have headaches if I didn't have it, you know, in mm. a given day or just energy. And so I just, I stopped and then um, actually, this is sort of a side plug and I just use it as a product that I like. Um, I got onto this product called Magic Mind and it's like matcha green tea. So it's mm. like, it's a startup and um, 
it's uh, sort of a an energy shot, but it's green tea based, and so it's not mm. even energy shot. It's uh, sort of a supplement that's matcha green tea based, and uh, I I've given up coffee, and it you know I feel like I have better energy uh, during the day than what I did before, and cool. uh, drinking more tea. So that's one one thing yeah, I've. Changed. I like that. I'm gonna yeah. matcha mind. Yeah. You said uh, magic mind. Magic the, mind. Okay, we're gonna the, we're definitely like that. Startup. I'm gonna try that out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what is a thing, what, what thing would you say, you know, best at this point in time? Whoa, that is a existential question right there. <laughs> you can go anywhere you want with it. <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay. Um, you, you can say bubble gum if you want. That's, that's, you know, whatever. <laughs> I probably know the inside of my house best right, right now. <laughs> um, no, let's, that's not an appropriate answer. That's not a serious answer. Um, you can have a fun answer. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think right now it's, uh, you know, I like, you know, I think my my superpower right now is I think on the continuous discovery piece. And so, mm. um, you know, sort of moving away from the culture side, like I love and, you know, the various different ways to do customer research and sort of understand customers and bringing in quant and qual and then mm-hmm. having that translate into like what, what, should we build versus what could we build and sort of prioritizing based on that. So, mm, nice. uh, and sort of then, you know, that's sort of a team sport. So, you know, I'm not a, a, a UX design expert, but, you know, love having those conversations and, and even bringing in, you know, sort of engineers into those, you know, uh, customer research discovery interviews and, and like that emotional connection. So trying to foster that environment of continuous discovery and sort of staying emotionally connected to your customer to make better decisions to invent on their behalf. It's huge, huge. Yeah. So, and then what question would you have the listener start asking themselves to take action on these ideas that we've been discussing? I think I'll I'll actually give two, so I'm going to cheat, but I think, you know, it's sort of a continuous improvement um, mindset. It's easy to sort of maybe complain or sort of feel like the victim on cultural issues sometimes with your company. I would just ask, what's a behavior you want to exhibit and do more, do less of like this week? And what's a little habit or ritual you could, you know, start trying to to make that happen. So like sort of take ownership of your company's culture and ask yourself, like, what could I, what's something I could try this week to be more customer centric, you know, anchor on your company's values, right? Be more, transparent, be more uh, agile, whatever it is, but like sort of take that ownership and ask yourself that question. And then I think something I've been interested about too, is like, how can you partner, you know, in product, we talk about like high leverage things, right? So if, if you're passionate about um, creating a better culture for your company and culture transformation, how can you be a better partner? How can you go make friends and sort of, you know, start to work side by side with somebody in HR or somebody in, you know, in, in maybe even finance that has some like high leverage things that could, you know, change the culture at a full company scale. And so those, I think the two questions I'd ask. Awesome. Yeah. I love it, Eric. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being here. This has been a really fun exploratory conversation right. about one of my favorite topics. So always a pleasure. Um, what would you like to leave the listener with and where can people follow up and engage with you if they'd like to reach out? Yeah. Well, thank you. This is fun. And it's fun to sort of tie in, athletics and culture and product. And this was as sort of unscripted as I was expecting and it was fun. So it was good. good. Um, yeah, I, I would just love to keep this conversation going. Um, I haven't seen this talked about a lot. And so if, if their listeners want to follow up, would, would love to, you know, have one-on-one conversations or if people even want to sort of follow up in some group format, you know, propose it and I'd love to jump on and sort of do an unconference type thing uh, or one-on-one conversation. So best place is I'm pretty active on Twitter. So just, you know, Eric Stiege on Twitter and DM me or follow me and uh, would love to love to keep this conversation going. Awesome. Eric, yeah. thanks again. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, I'd be so grateful if you could do me a favor and take about 25 seconds to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That helps me reach way more listeners, and it also helps me bring you more great guests. As always, please feel free to reach out to me anytime at connect at makethingsthatmatter.com. And until next time, my friends, leave them better than you found them. See you out there.